Okay, many thanks to the organizers and to Rupert who agreed to switch the talks so that I could give my first uh, lecture today. So um, I decided to, since this was a, a research school on, um, on geophysical flows, uh, I'll talk about a topic that, is, uh, that I like very much and that is very important in geophysical flows, which is a boundary layer method. So, and again, since this is uh, an introductory, uh, since this is a research school, I decided to focus on some fairly uh, general and introductory uh, material. So I apologize to those of you who know that very well, but uh, yeah, I, I'll start with very elementary stuff. Um, so first, let me give you a little bit of motivation. So uh, I'll start maybe with a, just a de definition of a, what a boundary layer is. So boundary layer is a zone of very small width that is uh, located in the vicinity of a boundary uh, and on which a certain physical quantity has strong variation. So the typical picture that you should have in mind is something like that. Okay, so you have a certain quantity which could be velocity, temperature, whatever, okay? And that has a very strong variation, so something like that. Okay, so let's say this is zero, this is one, uh, this is say uh, delta, okay? And if you have a picture like that, then you say that there is a boundary layer of size delta in the vicinity of the boundary, okay? Um, and it's very important in geophysical flows and uh, in particular in uh, ocean currents um, because boundary layers are one of the, I would say, of the driving forces of uh, the general oceanic circulation. So I'll just give two uh, important examples. The first one, uh, and I will come on, back on those two examples uh, today and tomorrow. The first one is Ekman layers. So Ekman layers are horizontal boundary layers. that are formed in a fluid uh, which, is, which is incompressible and uh, in the limit of high rotation and low viscosity. Okay. And so the, boundary, the role of the boundary layer is to balance the rotation with the dissipation forces coming from the viscosity. Okay. And uh, so when you look for pictures on, say, uh, Wikipedia, you find the following kind of picture. Uh, I think that will be fine. So uh, I'm not very good at drawing pictures, but okay, yeah, I'll give it a shot. So you have, say, the wind direction, which goes like this. Okay. Uh, so in, uh, say, uh, perpendicular to the blackboard. And then you have a surface current that makes an angle 45 degrees with the, so that's the wind. That's the surface current. And then you have a kind of spiral as you uh, go deep into the sea, the, the the surface current, its amplitude uh, diminishes, okay, because it's, uh, it's a boundary layer. So it's uh, this part that you're uh, looking at, except that it's kind of reverse, okay. It's uh, one minus this, say. Uh, so it's maximal at the surface, and then it diminishes. And as it diminishes, it also spirals uh, around the vertical axis. So this would be the vertical axis. Maybe I'll use a. Okay, and then you have a something that spirals like this. Not okay. As I said, I'm not very good at drawing. Okay, but <laughs> you can look up on Wikipedia, and you have a, better, a nicer picture than the one I'm drawing. But that's the idea. So you have a surface current that makes an angle 45 degrees, and then the total net transport makes actually an angle uh, 90 degrees with the with the wind, and. These layers are important because they are, uh, they are really the, 
the, the mechanism through which momentum is transferred from the wind to the, uh, the ocean currents. Okay, so this is really the, the, the way that you uh, uh, give some momentum to the ocean. Okay, so these are the first important layers that we will uh, encounter in this talk. And the other ones that I will be talking about uh, a lot are uh, Western boundary currents. So Western boundary currents are formed, uh, so these are vertical layers. that are formed, uh, so they also come in uh, uh, high rotation flows uh, with a low viscosity, but in, a, in a slightly different ways. In a, there are vertical layers that are formed near uh, the western boundaries of oceanic basins. So Actually, uh, you might have uh, many different scaling, different possible scalings in which you have different types of balances. So I won't go, it's not, uh, let's say, as uh, clear cut as the case of Ekman layers, where it's really a balance between rotation and, and uh, viscosity. In the case of Western boundary currents, there are different things that you can balance out with one another. So it's not completely as uh, you have different uh, possible scaling, say. But in all, uh, in all cases, you observe a very strong dissymmetry between the western boundary of the ocean and the eastern boundary of the ocean. And um, again, this is very important in the general uh, oceanic circulation because this is the way that very strong and famous currents are created. For instance, the Gulf Stream on the, um, on the uh, American coast, okay? Uh, is typically a west western boundary current. The Kuroshio current in Japan is also a western boundary current. And this is a, a way through which ocean is set into motion. Okay? So, uh, these boundary layer phenomena are really uh, ubiquitous in, uh, in all oceanic uh, dynamics. And so, this was one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about them. Uh, so, <clears throat> let me, uh, this was just for a very short uh, introduction and motivation. And uh, let me now very briefly sketch uh, why boundary layers and uh, how they are created from, a, let's say, a mathematical point of view. So, in, um, in many, diff in many uh, models from geophysical flows, you have a singular perturbation problem. So a singular perturbation problem is the following type of problem. Let's say that you have a, a differential operator A epsilon. So this is a differential operator. At this stage, it might be linear or nonlinear. I, I don't care. OK, uh, of order, say, D. OK, apply to U epsilon. So this is your unknown equals F. OK, uh, and you assume, so obviously uh, this epsilon uh, accounts for the fact that a epsilon depends on a small parameter, epsilon, that is intended to go to zero. And you assume that a epsilon has uh, the following structure. Uh, that assume that um, a epsilon uh, has the following property. So if u epsilon converges towards u bar in a strong stance, say uh, in dd, where d is the, the order of a, then uh, a epsilon of u epsilon converges towards a bar 
of u bar, where a bar, uh, maybe I should use um, Ah, not too much because otherwise there is a uh, And here a bar is a differential operator of order d prime, which is strictly less than d. So the typical example that I have in mind and uh, on which I will come back uh, in several instances today because it's, a, it's really a good time model, is the following. So you take uh, A epsilon to be minus epsilon dxx plus identity. Okay, so here you have D equals two. Okay, and if I uh, have a function U epsilon which converges towards U bar in C2, then A epsilon of U epsilon converges towards U bar. Okay, and so the limit operator is just uh, the identity, which is a order zero. Um, so in that case, you have D prime equals zero, D equal two. Okay, so if A epsilon uh, has the following uh, property, then uh, I say that A epsilon is a singular perturbation uh, operator. Uh, well, uh, then uh, I let me in, in this. Is a singular perturbation problem. Okay, um, and typically, if you look at a singular perturbation problem, well, generically, you can expect to have small scales. Okay, in general, as soon as you have a singular perturbation operator, and if you have a singular perturbation problem next to a boundary, you can expect to have boundary layers. Okay, this is a really a, a generic behavior. If you, it's just because, okay, for instance, if you look at this, uh, at this problem here, uh, let's say on the interval 0, 1, you will uh, endow this with two boundary conditions, one at 0, one at 1. Okay? And obviously, at the limit, these two boundary conditions are no longer satisfied in general. And so you need to have some correction to match uh, your uh, limit solution with the boundary conditions at the level of epsilon. Okay. So actually, uh, for this model with, uh, let's say, right hand side equal to one, you can write an explicit formula and uh, the solution will look like exactly like with delta equals square root of epsilon. But uh, yes, if you have a singular perturbation problem plus a boundary, this will create a boundary layer. This is a generic. And in fact, in uh, geophysical flows, you encounter this type of situation all the time. So you have uh, many different small parameters. Uh, so I haven't been able to, uh, to um, attend the first talks of uh, Rupert and uh, Edris, but I'm sure that they presented uh, uh, some models in which you had small parameters, so you might have a, so the, in the cases I will be interested in, the, the, the small parameters I will be working with a lot are the Rosby number, which measures the strength of the rotation, and the viscosity, but you might have a, a many other uh, small parameters in, uh, in your problem. Good. Uh, so this is the, let's say, the, the generic reason why boundary layers are created. And now, um, the, from a mathematical point of view, the, the questions that you want to address are the following. Uh, so the first one is the construction of the boundary layer. So. Uh, by this. Uh, there are actually several sub-questions, so you 
might wonder what the boundary layer size is, the boundary layer profile. And so, so when, I, uh, when I talk about boundary layer size and boundary layer profile, uh, here what I mean, so sometimes you might have an explicit profile, but in other cases where you don't have an explicit profile, what you want to do is some, prove some well postedness on your boundary layer equation. So this is the first question, and then the other question, once you, which is uh, okay in a second step, but it's disconnected from this one, is the, let's say, the proof of validity of your boundary layer ansatz. So uh, I'll give examples where uh, I don't know if this is completely clear for you at the moment, but so quite often what happens is the following. You have a, an actual solution, which is u epsilon. And what you want to do is describe u epsilon into, in, simple, in simpler terms. So you want to write u epsilon, let's say, as some function u bar, which will be your solution in the interior of the domain, plus a boundary layer part, which is a correction. Okay? And let's say that you are able to construct each of these profiles uh, separately. So you are able to say, OK, well, u bar is going to solve this equation, which is well posed. It has a unique solution, blah, blah, blah. Same thing for your boundary layer part. So you're very happy. You are able to construct both bricks, say, of your uh, approximate solution. And then the story is not over, because you still want to prove that your true solution, u epsilon, is actually close to this sum. OK? And that's something else. It's a different question. That's what I call the validity of your boundary layer answer. OK? Uh, so these are typically the two, the two questions that you want to address. OK? Um, and so uh, I'll do, um, I'll, I'll try to address these questions in a, in a number of situations. So first, for, so for the rest of the lecture today, I will focus on uh, the linear theory. Well, well it, maybe not linear theory is not a very good uh, uh, term, but uh, I'm afraid that if I erase with this, then I won't be able to write. OK. Merci. Uh, let's say, uh, rather, the methodology. in the linear case with constant coefficients and near a flat boundary. So it's a very long title, but uh, so <coughs> Uh, in, in this case, so in the linear case, constant coefficients, flat boundary, uh, actually, there are a number of situations in uh, geophysical flows that fall within this, uh, let's say, this framework. And, um, and, so, and still, so you're able to say a lot of things in that case. And the advantage is that, of course, uh, if you think of, say, uh, ODEs, you see that you are able to, you have a number of tools uh, available to study such problems. So, uh, so essentially, uh, the, the, the reason why you are working with uh, constant coefficients near a flat boundary is that you are going to be able to use Fourier, okay? Or uh, decompose your solution into modal solution. So that's the, uh, the important thing. OK, and, uh, and then so we have a general methodology uh, in that case, which I wanted to explain. And then uh, in tomorrow's lecture, I will uh, investigate the, both some limitations and extensions 
of the linear theory of, uh, of this methodology. Okay, I'll mostly stay, I think, in the linear case as well, but I will uh, talk a little bit about uh, quasi-linear scenarios, which are perturbations of the linear ones. Okay, and then in the last lecture, I will talk about uh, a setting which is completely different from the ones of A and B, uh, but which is also present in some uh, cases in, uh, in oceanographic flows, and which is also very important in general for uh, boundary layers in uh, fluid mechanics. So I will talk about the Pontal system. And uh, so uh, I think uh, you could give uh, maybe 10 or 20 hour lectures on the Pontal system. So because uh, the, the, the body of literature now is so vast that uh, one and an hour and a half wouldn't suffice. So I will focus on, say, uh, specific features of the Pontal system, and I will look mostly at the stationary case. Uh, I, I will mention briefly some uh, results in the non-stationary case, but I think that uh, uh, David uh, Gerard-Varet in his talk this afternoon will recall some of them as well. No? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, if, are there questions so far? No? Well, in that case, uh, I will start with the... Uh, the first, uh, the first part, okay, if I'm able to bring this down, no, but wait, wait, um, c'est bizarre, non? Je pense que quand je relâche, ça, il est coincé, euh, là, je suis trop petite, hein, <laughs> ah, voilà. Oh, and yes, one last thing that I was meaning to say uh, before I started, that um, I, I think in, uh, so, uh, in uh, theoretical PDEs, people are used to, uh, so I, I will adopt the same terminology as is classical in, uh, in uh, theoretical PDEs, which is the one that I mentioned earlier. So you. Uh, when you write an, an asymptotic expansion, you decompose your solution into an interior part plus a correction. And that correction is the boundary layer. So the boundary layer decays far from the boundary, usually. Okay, except for the Pontal system. But in all of the other cases, that's the convention. Your boundary layer solution is decaying far from the boundary. This is equivalent to, but uh, maybe not exactly the same uh, type of uh, mind frame as uh, the one of uh, matched asymptotic expansions, in which you have uh, what is called an outer solution and an inner solution, and you match the two. Okay? Both are equivalent. It's just a matter of writing. Uh, uh, okay, uh, so uh, typically in the picture that I just erased, I think you have something which is. Uh, 1 minus exponential minus uh, x over uh, square root of epsilon, say. OK, so uh, typically, uh, I will call this, this the interior term, 1. And this will be my boundary layer part. So this vanishes on the boundary. And it, uh, okay. this will be the boundary layer part. Uh, in um, matched asymptotic expansions, I think uh, you, this whole thing is what would be called your uh, outer solution, okay? And so it matches one far from the boundary. It's, it's just a matter of convention what you put within the boundary layer or not. But uh, I just wanted to, to, to mention that. Okay, 
So, um, I'll start with uh, so the linear case uh, near a flat boundary, and uh, throughout the lecture, I will. Uh, Okay, uh, uh, there are two examples on which I will be um, I will be working. Uh, so one is the toy model that I just mentioned, and another one will be Ekman layers. So maybe I'll keep uh, I'll I'll treat the case of Ekman layers here and my uh, toy model right there. And uh, this uh, the left part of this board will be for the general theory. So. A is now the linear methodology. Okay. So the setting is the following. Um, I'm assuming that I have so an operator uh, A epsilon which is a, differential, a linear differential uh, operator uh, of order d. So I'm assuming that it has the following form. It's a sum for uh, alpha in n to the power n with uh, alpha less than d of a alpha of epsilon nabla alpha. Okay, uh, so it's linear, and I'm assuming that A alpha of epsilon is polynomial in epsilon uh, with the following properties. So first, I'm assuming that A alpha of 0 is equal to 0 if uh, the alpha is equal to the highest number of derivatives. Okay. And that there exists some uh, alpha which is uh, strictly less than d, such that A alpha of 0 is different from 0. So again, For my toy model, which is A alpha of epsilon, uh, sorry, A epsilon equals minus epsilon dxx plus identity. Uh, in that case, you have d equal to uh, A2 of epsilon is minus epsilon, so it's 0 at point 0 and it's polynomial. Uh, a1 of epsilon is 0, and A0 of 0 is 1. Okay, so you can check that it falls within uh, this framework. Uh, the other example that I wanted to talk about are Ekman layers. Okay, uh, so as I said, Ekman layers are layers which occur when you uh, balance a high rotation term with a low viscosity um, near a boundary. So in that case, you look at the following equation. Uh, maybe actually I write it in a, I think I wrote it in a stationary context. Yes. So you look at the following equation. Divergence of u equal epsilon equals zero. Okay, and that will be in a domain uh, R3 plus. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, so and so in that case, your unknown is uh, u epsilon. which is u epsilon p epsilon. So this is a vector in R4. <coughs> uh, 
and you can uh, rewrite this, uh, this equation into the following uh, system. Uh, so uh, A epsilon will be the following operator. So it will be a 4 by 4 uh, matrix. So first, I'll write the, the, the rotation term. So it will be something like that. OK. Then I write the pressure term. So the pressure term will be d1, d2, Three. Then I will have the Laplacian. And the divergence free condition on the last line. And the rows elsewhere. Okay. Uh, so you see, because of the epsilon minus ones, it's not a, it's not really polynomial. But let me maybe factor out by epsilon minus one right here. And then I have to change epsilon into epsilon square. Put epsilon in front of the gradient everywhere. And this becomes 1. OK. And now uh, if I look at this operator, then it has exactly the form that I wanted. OK, so it's uh, a bit more complicated because it's a matrix, but, uh, uh, but otherwise, uh, good. So, uh, so in that case, uh, forgive me, but I'm not, I don't want to write down every single coefficient. Okay, I leave that as an exercise. But uh, okay, once you have the whole matrix, it's not so not so hard. But you can see that in that case as well, uh, a epsilon is a further two. Good. Um, so now the question is what you want to do uh, with, uh, with, uh, with this operator. And so the strategy and so I think it goes back to Eckhaus and Van Dyke, but I think it's very uh, I think it's very natural if you think of, uh, of ODEs at least. Uh, so the strategy is to look for a solution of, uh, of uh, this equation, which is a modal solution, so it's an exponential. Okay? So uh, let's say that you're looking, uh, so you look uh, uh, for solutions of A epsilon u epsilon equals zero in, say, R on Rn plus, so Rn plus is uh, Rn minus 1 cross R plus, okay? My last uh, variable, which is uh, Xn, lives in the, uh, the half line. Uh, in the form, u epsilon of x equals, uh, so exponential i, Psi prime x prime, so x prime, uh, this will be uh, my variable living in Rn minus 1, and uh, this one will be uh, xn, uh, minus lambda xn times some u epsilon. 
Okay. So U epsilon, uh, maybe yeah, V epsilon. Okay. So V epsilon will be some profile living uh, in CK. Some vector, okay. Uh, so here, uh, psi prime and x prime are in are in minus one. Uh, lambda is a complex number, and you want lambda to have a positive real part. Okay, so you, because you want to have decaying solutions uh, far from the boundary, and actually, you even want uh, if you are looking for a boundary layer, you even want the real part of lambda to be very large. Okay. So you plug this into your uh, into your equation. Mm -hmm. Well. In that case, it will be one. In that case, it will be four. It's the total size. It's, it's the number of unknowns in your system. Because in that case, you see, it will be, uh, you have three components for U and one for P. Uh, I, I didn't define it. I didn't introduce it before. But that's the four. It's the four in this case. So K, maybe I'll write this down here. K is the number of unknowns. So it's not the dimension of the space, it's not the order of our operator, it's really the number of unknowns that have. Okay, so you plug that uh, into the equation. <coughs> and so you remember that wh when you have a when you have an OD like this, okay, uh, when you plug this into your equation, you get the characteristic equation for lambda. Well, here it's exactly the same, actually. When you plug that into your equation, what you obtain you, is a linear system. which has the following form. So it's a big matrix, which I will call A epsilon, which depends on psi prime and on lambda, applied to my vector V epsilon equals zero. Okay? So this is a K by K matrix in which all coefficients are polynomial in epsilon, psi prime, and lambda. OK? So maybe I'll uh, do the computation in the, these two simple cases so that you see uh, where I'm. Um, but maybe I'll just write the, the conclusion right here on this line, and then I'll do the computation. And so what I'm looking for is obviously a non-trivial solution of this system. Okay? And so you know that this is it's a really just basic linear algebra. You know that this system has a non-trivial solution if and only if the determinant of uh, A epsilon is equal to zero. And this gives you your characteristic equation for lambda. Okay, so I'll do the computation for the time model. It's, uh, so in that case, you have uh, k which is equal to 1, so it's uh, easy. Okay, and in that case, uh, if I plug in, uh, so I have uh, uh, n which is also equal to 1, so there is no psi prime, there's just lambda. 
And in that case, uh, my A epsilon of lambda is just minus epsilon lambda squared plus 1. Okay, and so uh, the determinant, so it's a, it's a one by one matrix, so its determinant is itself. And so I have a, a non trivial solution if and only if lambda is equal to uh, 1 over square root of epsilon. Yes, but in that case, it's a one by one matrix. So the, the determinant is itself. So this is a. So the determinant of uh, A epsilon is uh, A epsilon itself. Okay. And it's equal to zero if and only if lambda is equal to one over square root, plus or minus one over square root of epsilon, but you discard the root with a positive real part uh, with a negative real part because it would it would lead to an exponential growth and you want to Avoid that one. So you only keep the one that uh, has positive real. Okay, so in the case of uh, the Ekman layer, <coughs> uh, so uh, forget about the one over epsilon in front, uh, the, the matrix A epsilon of uh, psi prime lambda looks like this. <clears throat> so you will have minus epsilon uh, lambda square minus uh, maybe plus everywhere. So epsilon uh, psi square minus lambda square on the diagonal. And there's a square here as well. You still have minus one, one for the rotation. And then here you have i epsilon psi one, i epsilon psi two, minus lambda, same thing here. Uh, probably minus epsilon lambda. Uh, minus epsilon lambda and zero and zeros elsewhere. Okay. If you want to, it's just the symbol of the matrix that I wrote for the previous. Okay. And then if you follow, uh, so this will be your big matrix. Uh, a epsilon, so you have a 4 by 4 matrix and you need to compute its determinant. Uh, so it's not fun, but it's not the end of the world either, okay, because there are a lot of zeros. So I did that for you and I can give you the answer. Uh, okay, and so its determinant. in that case is epsilon to the 4 minus lambda squared. Okay. And uh, so then <coughs> you need to look at the roots uh, so you have a, uh, okay, your determinant here is a polynomial in lambda, in general, okay, with coefficients that are themselves polynomials in epsilon and xi prime. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll uh, continue here for the general uh, theory.
So, uh, the determinant so this application is a polynomial. In lambda with coefficients that are polynomial in epsilon and psi prime. So, in general, uh, it has a, if it's of degree, I don't know, uh, you can choose the uh, Q, it has Q complex roots. But you only want to keep the roots that have positive real part. And also, you want to look at the behavior of these roots as epsilon goes to zero. OK? Uh, so in that case, you see you have a polynomial of degree 6. Really, it's a polynomial of degree 3 in lambda 2, but okay, polynomial of degree 6. And so we will have, in general, a 6 complex roots. So you have a uh, call this p epsilon. Uh, so we have degree p of epsilon complex roots, which may be uh, distinct or equal. And then you use a few facts from a complex analysis. So the fact number one is that uh, as epsilon goes to zero, um, all roots behave like epsilon to the power my, uh, let's say, Q. Q all roots say lambda i behave like uh, epsilon to the power qi times some ui. So qi will be, of course, it depends on psi prime. And the important thing is that it's a rational number. And mu i is a mu i of psi prime. And uh, it's different from zero. Okay. So you know that your roots necessarily behave in this way. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. So the second thing what I want to say. Yes, so the boundary layer size associated with a uh, given root is uh, the inverse of the size of uh, real part lambda. Uh, and then the one question that you often want to ask is when you construct a, a solution, thanks to an interior term and a boundary layer, is how many boundary conditions you can lift thanks to your boundary layer. Okay, that's a typical question that, you, that, that you're going to ask. And uh, so, this is, it's a bit complicated because it depends on the type of boundary condition that you're looking at, but Let's say that you're, uh, you're uh, enforcing a, a Dirichlet boundary condition on your boundary, okay? So that you're assuming that uh, the, the trace of u epsilon is prescribed, something like that. In that case, the number of boundary conditions that can be lifted by the boundary layer is the dimension of the vector space generated by all the vectors uh, v, 
epsilon of lambda, uh, where uh, so v epsilon lambda is such that a epsilon of xi prime lambda v epsilon lambda equals zero and real part of lambda very big. Okay. Why? Because this is typically your boundary layer profile. When you construct a generic boundary layer solution, you're going to take a linear combination of such, uh, of such profiles, of uh, the uh, exponential i x i prime uh, x prime minus lambda x n v n, the epsilon. Okay, so you're, you're going to take linear combinations of the, such things. And the trace of those on the boundary are exactly the v epsilon. To the, uh, the Fourier coefficient. Okay, so if you want to look at how many, wh what's the di total dimension of the vector space, your uh, how many boundary conditions you are going to be able to lift? It's exactly the dimension of the vector space generated by the traces of this boundary condition. Okay, if I had uh, let's say a Neumann boundary condition, then it would be a bit different. I would need to add a lambda somewhere. Okay, but so. Uh, I just needed to, to choose a, a setting to, to do the computation. Okay, um, so may, now maybe uh, let me do the example for the... So in that case, I already computed the, the boundary layer. So here it's very simple because you, you just have one root with positive real part, okay? So this means that you can lift one boundary condition, which is, uh, uh, but again, this is exactly what you expected, but you can lift one on, on each side, so, so you're good. Okay, so in that case, you can lift one boundary condition. So now, for the case of uh, Ekman layers, it's a bit more complicated. Um, so you have six complex roots. Uh, four of them are um, of size, uh, so we have four roots of size epsilon minus one. Okay, uh, because so we see these are the roots that you obtain when you say that epsilon to the four times lambda six should be as the same size as lambda to the square. Okay. So when you do that, uh, so your roots, uh, so say that lambda will behave like epsilon minus one times some capital lambda, and your capital lambda will be such that uh, lambda to the power four uh, is equal to one. Uh, minus one, one, uh, min minus one, I think. Okay, just plug this into your equation right there. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, so you get exactly two roots that have a positive real part and two roots which have a negative real part. Okay. And so, by the way, so your, uh, your roots are uh, uh, okay, exponential, uh, plus or minus, i pi over 4, okay? Um, and this i pi over 4 is exactly the 45 degree angle that I was mentioning in the beginning, okay? Remember that? Uh, it's, it's exactly what gives you the, 
the, that, that angle. And the fact that you have a 90 degree uh, net transport uh, angle with the net transport is just the fact that when you integrate all this with respect to z, you, uh, you don't have i pi over 4, but i, actually, and that's your uh, 45 degrees. OK, so you have uh, four roots that behave like this. And you actually have uh, two roots, which are uh, very small and which are of size epsilon square. So these are uh, plus or minus epsilon square psi 3. Okay, so these are very small, so they don't correspond to a boundary layer. So these ones, even if they have a, their a real part has a good sign, you discard them. They, you're not interested in them, they don't correspond to a boundary layer. Okay, so when you look at everything, this means that you have exactly two roots which will correspond to a boundary layer. Okay, these are the two uh, right there that have a nice sign uh, for, the positive, for the real part. Uh, and when you look at the associated eigenvectors, they are uh, like uh, 1 plus or minus i. So the, this dimension right there is equal to 2. <coughs> Furthermore, the uh, okay. Eigenvectors associated with, uh, let me call them the boundary layer roots, are one ah, uh, plus or minus i. Uh, and then I don't remember what happens for the next two components. Well, I, I know a little bit. The third one will be a further epsilon because of the divergence free condition. And the last one on the pressure, I don't recall what its size is. I think it's uh, epsilon square. I think it's epsilon square. I'm not too sure, but I think so. Uh, but when you look at the vector space spans by these two vectors, you obtain something that is at least of dimension 2. Well, that is exactly of dimension 2. Uh, so this means that you can lift the boundary condition. And by the way, okay, two is not equal to three. <laughs> okay, uh, so if you if you had a, if you think that you have a Dirichlet boundary condition on for your uh, for your fluid uh, for for u epsilon, then you uh, actually you don't you you have a so you assume that say uh, u epsilon is zero on the boundary. And your epsilon has three components, okay? Not two, three. Uh, so this means that your boundary layer will not be able to lift all the traces of your, your uh, interior uh, uh, solution on the boundary, okay? So there is something that needs to be handled in a, okay, through a process that will not be entirely the boundary layer. And this is precisely, <coughs> sorry. This is precisely the source of the Ekman pumping, okay? It's, it's precisely the source of the Ekman pumping. Uh, <coughs> the fact that your, uh, <coughs> so let's say your boundary layer will be able to lift the horizontal part of your uh, trace, and, and then for the vertical part, there will be a remainder that is responsible for the transfer of momentum from the, the, the wind or, or, 
or uh, the, the, the friction on the boundary to the interior of the fluid. Okay, so this is actually uh, the fact that uh, you do not lift all your boundary conditions um, thanks to the boundary layer here is really very important for the process of transfer from energy from the boundary to the fluid. Okay, I know that I'm going a bit too clear. Yes. How can I make sure that it will be a free W zero at the bound? Well, you can't be sure. I think that's the issue. Uh, you, you uh, so. I think there are several ways of seeing this construction. The, the most pedestrian one that I know is the, the following. You, 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 let's say you construct an interior flow. Okay. This interior flow has a trace. You lift the horizontal trace. Uh, so the, the vertical trace is, uh, is zero because of the non-penetration condition. That's because of the, okay, so that's fine. So you lift the horizontal trace thanks to the boundary layer. Okay, so you're very happy. But uh, because your boundary layer is divergence-free, its vertical trace is not zero on the boundary. Okay, you, you completely fixed its, uh, its uh, horizontal trace. And then when you do that, then the, you, you see there's a O of epsilon here. So you will have a trace of size epsilon for the vertical part on the boundary. And that's just life. Okay? And so it's there and it's non-zero, but it will add an additional, uh, you, you need to add a corrector term of size epsilon in the interior flow that will match this, um, the, this, this uh, condition here. And okay, so it's size epsilon, so you might say it doesn't matter, but actually it does because when you penalize it with one over epsilon, it gets of size one. Okay, and so that's the reason why you get this transfer of momentum. It's, uh, so you, you can see it in a different way by uh, integrating out the, um, the... If the outer flow works, mm -hmm. then you fall on your nose. Exactly. So, it scores the zero velocity. Yes, exactly. You can get a kind of re retraction from the... Uh, yes. <laughs> Sorry? I have a matching layer. Well, I think that's what it is. It is uh, again, it's just a, a question of terminology. It depends on whether you, you, you... I think the matching layer is just the interior flow plus the boundary layer. Uh, it's the same thing. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the, that's about what I wanted to say for the general terminology. And maybe I'll just... Uh, sure. uh, ah, <laughs> so close. <laughs> C'est ridicule. <laughs> Je vais trouver la réponse ici. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um
so here I gave you a very uh, general methodology, but there is no, uh, there is no theorem. Uh, I didn't write any theorem. But I think the, the, um, the really uh, rigorous part was achieved by uh, David Giravare and Thierry Paul. Uh, so I, I won't write down the, the complete statement because the, there are a number of assumptions, so I'll just uh, wave my hands a little. Um, but the statement is the following. Uh, I, I'll just write down the part that I'm, that I'm uh, interested in, so this is uh, not... Uh, I, I, it won't be uh, exactly the way the theorem is stated, but let's say under... Um, some uh, technical assumptions. Okay, and assuming also uh, that QI <coughs> is uh, independent. of Xi prime and mu i does not vanish. And this is what I would call, this is an important assumption and this is what I will call a non-degeneracy. Following this methodology, Uh, a solution can be constructed up to any other. So actually, uh, the paper of David and Thierry Paul is, is set in a more, much more general setting that, uh, than the one I just wrote. So for instance, you, uh, you can treat some uh, some boundaries that are not flat by just uh, you know, uh, uh, lifting out the boundary and so on. And so we use the schools of uh, semi-classical analysis. Uh, but yeah, I would say that the, the, the idea is uh, more or less the one I wrote. And so the important assumption here is the one that I wrote in red. Uh, well, the one that I extracted from the theorem is the, the one that I will be uh, talking about in, uh, in tomorrow's lecture. So about uh, non-degeneracy, and uh, because actually, well, what I will, uh, I, I'll try to convince you that uh, in general, if QI depends on uh, Xi prime, then more or less, I, I wouldn't say that everything falls apart, but uh, the intuition that you get thanks to this uh, methodology is wrong, okay, and you need to do something else. So, yes, so, so uh, I, I think this uh, method is really important because first it works in a number of uh, uh, cases and, um, and, and also it gives you an idea of what the, at least in linear cases, what, what the boundary layer sizes should be, okay? I, uh, at least uh, as far as I know, uh, the, the, it, was, it was never wrong in that respect. So maybe, uh, so I still have uh, like 10 minutes, something like that. Okay, so I'll just mention uh, another example that is uh, a bit more complicated than the two I wrote and, uh, and in which this, uh, this methodology can be applied. Is it okay I can erase uh, everything here?
another more complicated example. So this was a, a joint work with uh, uh, Roberta Bianchini and Laure Saint-Raymond. Um, that we started after some discussions uh, of Laure Saint-Raymond with uh, Thierry Doxois and NS Lyon. Um, and so the purpose was to study the, um, the reflection of internal waves on a sloped boundary. Okay, so <coughs> the, uh, the idea is the following, it's, and it's, uh, so it's an experiment that uh, Thierry Doxois does in his group in NS Lyon. So you have a a plane like this, okay, with an angle gamma. And here you have a stratified fluid. Okay. And you send in an, an internal wave on the, on the boundary, okay, with a given angle. Uh, so the way they do this is they have a flap, and so they can create internal waves with uh, exactly the time frequency that they want, just by uh, monitoring the, the frequency of the flap. And actually, uh, because of the dispersion relation of internal waves, once you con control the, the, the time frequency, you also control the angle of propagation. Okay. So you control perfectly uh, the angle with which this internal waves arrives on your slope down. And the question is uh, how this, uh, this internal wave is uh, reflected. And in particular, you see that when it arrives at an angle which is equal to gamma, uh, they observed some kind of uh, concentration of energy, so it's equally a boundary layer, uh, um, on, on the close to the boundary. And they, uh, so they, they had, uh, Thierry Doxois and Bill Jung had some uh, explanation for part of the phenomenon, but, uh, but not completely, and, uh, and, and, so, and so we looked into it. So uh, I won't have time to write down everything, but I'll, I'll just uh, I'll write the system and explain what we, what we find. So the, if I write it in its simplest form, the system is the Boussines. model. Uh, so the unknowns are the velocity and, uh, and, the, and the buoyancy. So the buoyancy is the variation of, uh, of the density. And so it reads like this. So it's uh, dTV uh, plus the gradient of P minus nu Laplacian. Write this down. Uh, kappa Laplacian of V equals minus B E3 DTB uh, minus N square V3 minus Kappa Laplacian B equals zero. So this will be uh, in my domain omega, which is uh, above my slope boundary. And divergence of V equals zero. So V is 2D, okay. and, uh, and B is the buoyancy, N is the brunt weissala frequency, and I will take N to be equal to 1 is the, in the following. Actually, uh, so you can add a number of things, you can add a convection term, okay. uh, it has to be small, okay. uh, uh, and you can take different viscosities here, it's just for the purpose of uh, the explanation that I, uh, I didn't want to, to go into that. Um, okay, so <clears throat> you see this is again a linear system with constant coefficients. Okay, so I won't do all the process that I did over there. You have a boundary that is flat. So here I wrote it in the, uh, so this is, uh, E1 is like this, E3 is like that. 
but you can of course change coordinates and use coordinates that are adapted to the boundary and you should if you want to write a boundary layer. Okay, so you can do the whole uh, thing that I just explained for uh, Ekman layers. You, uh, you write your big matrix, it will be again a 4x4 four four matrix because you have uh, four unknowns, V1, V3, B and P. Okay, so it will, you write, yes. Ah, thank you, kappa is small. Kappa will be small. Okay, so you, um, you can write your big 4x4 uh, four four matrix, you look at its determinants, blah, 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 blah. And the, so let me skip that part. And the determinant that you find, so for what I will call, uh, say, A kappa of lambda, is the following thing. So it will be kappa square, <coughs> psi square minus lambda to the power 3, minus, uh, ah, yes, so I have a time frequency, so I have a, an i omega, who, so it's a bit horrible, but uh, this is intentional. I just wanted to show you that it was not always as simple as uh, the two examples that I wrote earlier, and you can still say something, okay? Uh, minus 2i k lambda sine gamma cosine gamma plus omega square minus sine square of gamma lambda square plus psi square sine square of gamma minus omega square. Okay, so just to fix, uh, to, to explain a little, omega is the time frequency of the incident wave. Like I said, you, uh, you actionate a flap, uh, and exactly the frequency of the flap. <coughs> and, uh, and I think the rest of the notation, I already introduced them. Okay, so you get something that is, uh, oui, comment? K, c, x, c. Thank you. Um, okay, so you have, okay, this, this one is a bit complicated, okay? You, it's not so easy to, uh, to guess what the behavior of the roots is at first glance, but you see, you, you can still perform the same analysis, okay? So you, uh, you have something that is of degree six, so you know that we'll have six complex roots, and you can try to guess what the behavior of these roots are when kappa goes to zero. Okay, so that's what we did, and actually, um, so I, I'm not sure I'll write everything, but it depends on this parameter here, which I would call zeta, which is the criticality parameter, and this is important because, uh, so actually, when zeta is close to zero, this means that the incident wave is arriving exactly with an angle ga uh, gamma on the, on, the, uh, on the slope. And this is the case when you expect to have a concentration of energy. Okay? So it's normal that this um, critical parameter should play a role. But let me explain a bit what happens. So when, um, well, let's say that zeta is, equal, is far away from zero. So say equal to one. So first, you see that this parameter is always small, this one is always small as well, and so if these three terms here have coefficients that are of order one, then you will already get two roots that are of order one in your equation, right? If uh, this zeta is, uh, say, one, uh, this is one, this is one, then you, you have uh, two of them will behave uh, like, like the roots of this uh, polynomial of the degree two, so you have two roots. And these two roots correspond to the incident and the reflected wave. Okay? Okay, so that's two out of six. Okay, and then you look at the product of all roots. The product of all roots is like one over k square. Okay, so you have four remaining roots, and their product is one over k square. So it's a reasonable assumption to think that all our remaining roots k like 
1 over square root of k. Okay? And if you do that, you find, uh, a, you, you find exactly the, the correct uh, behavior for the root. So in the case when your criticality parameter is far away from zero, so it's not the critical reflection case, you have a reflected wave and a boundary layer of size square root of k. Okay? And then you can vary zeta here to see how the roots behave when, uh, when zeta gets smaller and smaller. And what you find is, uh, so you have different regimes, okay? You have a complicated transition, but when zeta is very small, uh, um, actually, so you still have, so if, if it's actually equal to zero and you can forget about that, you still have one root, which is a further one. Okay, this will correspond to your incident wave. You can check that you will still have uh, one uh, root, or uh, well, actually more than that, but uh, uh, you will still get um, uh, two roots that are of size uh, kappa to the minus one half. Okay, and that will balance this term with this one. So that's two roots kappa to the minus one half, and then you have a, so that's three roots one which is one, and two that are uh, kappa to the minus one half. And so you have three roots remaining, and their product must be like kappa to the minus one. So a good guess is that they are kappa to the minus one third, and this is exactly what you find. Okay, so essentially, the, even the complicated cases like this, when uh, things are not explicit, you can still guess what the behavior of the roots is like. Either you plug in this type of expansion and you, okay, you, you, you take an ansatz and you guess what the, the, the Q should be like, or you find part of the roots and you, uh, you use, like I, like I just did, the, the fact that you know the product of all of them to check, to, to guess what the other should be like. Okay, and I think I'll stop here and thank you very much.